So again, my name is Johnny Lotesta. I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. Uh, thank you for joining um, my colleague, Gali Rakabi, uh, and I for the third session of our uh, past, present, and future of American labor organizing study group. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gali, um, who will introduce our two fabulous speakers for the day. Well, thank you, Johnny. Um, so this is the first, I think, for the labor workshop to be online. So we might have a few glitches, so be patient uh, with us. Um, the idea for the labor workshop came from uh, when Johnny and I noticed that there was a gap at the Kennedy School's uh, curriculum, a gap of um, labor and employment policy issues, uh, a gap that uh, failed to address uh, curriculum that failed to address the role of the U.S. labor movement in U.S. De democracy, industrial democracy, or uh, political democracy, and we thought about introducing some of the main issues, main subjects that uh, labor and employment folks and uh, people in the labor movement feel are crucial and try to bring it into the Kennedy School. So that's the background of why we did it. Um, you're joining to the, uh, for the third uh, session. The original idea for the session was to talk about the legal and political attacks on the U.S. labor movement, but we decided to shift um, focus because of the recent um, uh, events and trying to understand, I think, the overall question that I come into the session is the main challenges and opportunities that COVID-19 present to U.S. workers, to the U.S. labor movement, and basically try to understand what are some of the big questions uh, that workers, workers advocates, activists, policy people are now trying to get a grip on. Um, understand what is what is the terrain, the policy terrain, and what is up, what is up for grabs. And so in order to do that, in order to kind of try to get a bite of those really big questions, we have two wonderful uh, speakers from two extraordinary uh, organizations. Our first speaker would be uh, Laura Padin from the National Employment Law Project, uh, an amazing group of uh, policy research and, and activism who's trying to get a hold of what's happening both in the state level and on the federal level with regard to the policy terrain of um, uh, working people of, uh, of U.S. labor force. And basically, so Laura would be our first speaker. And then we're going to hear from Rachel Lauter from uh, Working Washington. Uh, again, a wonderful organization, the best of the best, with some uh, David versus Goliath. Uh, type wins uh, on its uh, track record. And we're going to hear from her about her perspective, her organization perspective, in one of the at least uh, former hotspots of the COVID 19. What's her take on what workers are facing, what workers are doing in order to answer those uh, kinds of challenges? Um, so, Johnny would moderate uh, the QA that would follow uh, the two speakers. And just a heads up, Next week, we're going to have a special session about the future of labor policy uh, in the U.S. and um, how, how do we come out of it, of the COVID-19, and where do we want to uh, go next? We'll feature two, again, wonderful speakers, Sharon Block from the Labor and Work Life Program here at Harvard, and uh, David Whale that um, needs no uh, introduction. Um, so, uh, Laura, the mic is yours. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Laura Padin. I'm with the National Employment Law Project. Uh, I'm on a team called Work Structures. We focus on, um, the, on I, I guess, contracting out relationships. So independent contracting, temping out, uh, a kind of the trend of employers, instead of hiring workers directly, hiring them through companies or calling them independent contractors. Um, so I thought I'd talk a bit today about uh, the federal bills that passed in the past couple of weeks and the protections for workers in those bills and the gaps in protections and what we really need, you know, in either additional federal legislation or for states to step in um, and help workers. Um, so I created a few slides to share with everyone so you could follow along. Let me just attempt to share my screen here. Hold on. Mm. Okay, can you all see my PowerPoint presentation now? Okay. 
just pull up the other part of it. One second. Oh, oops. All right, one second. I just want to pull up the other part. Okay, so um, there are two bills that passed through Congress in the past couple of weeks uh, that I think have um, that um, have some protections for workers in them. And there's a lot in the bills, but I'm really just going to focus on the employee rights and, and protections. So the first bill um, was the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Um, and the big provision in there for workers is uh, a leave, leave, paid leave. There's two types of paid leave in that law. The first is a paid sick leave provision uh, that gives two weeks of paid sick leave for coronavirus related reason. Um, and so there's a few different, the, the reasons are pretty narrow. It's if uh, an employee has a medical diagnosis of COVID-19, to comply with a public health officials or healthcare providers recommend recommendation to isolate, to care for an individual who's subject to quarantine or isolation, to care for a child if a school or daycare is closed due to COVID-19 or a similar condition. Um, and there's, so there's a, the, I would say one of the biggest issues with this provision is that it has kind of glaring exemptions. The biggest one that's gotten the most kind of uh, attention is that it exempts employers with over 500 employees, which is a huge number of workers that will not be able to access the, this provision. It also allows employers with fewer than 50 employees to seek an exemption from the DOL. And it also allows uh, certain healthcare providers and first responder, employers of certain healthcare responders, re providers and first responders to seek an exemption from the DOL as well. So it really exempts a really large swath of the US workforce. And I would also say that for some, yeah. I have a quick clarifying question that others oh, might have too. Um, how is that paid sick leave when it is provided paid out? Is the requirement that the employer pays that cost or is it paid for um, through federal funds? Oh, that's, that's a great question. So the employer pays out the funds initially, but then can seek reimbursement through the federal government through tax credits. So the federal government is going to provide tax credits to employers to, to either wholly or partially fund this. Oh, actually, I think, no, I do believe the tax credits do fund this entirely. Um, however, so there's a few limitations. For, so for some of the qualifying reasons, uh, a worker will only get two thirds of their pay. So if you're caring for an individual who's subject to quarantine, or you're caring for your own child whose school or daycare is closed, you'll be entitled to two thirds rate of pay. And your employer would then be reimbursed through tax credits for two thirds of your pay. Um, and if your employer, for instance, decided to give you full pay, they would only still be in re reimbursed for two thirds. So the federal government is really kind of footing the bill entirely here. Um, the second part of this, the second part of this law, the pay, second paid leave provision is emergency paid leave. And it's 12 weeks of emergency paid leave for employees. First 10 days are unpaid and then an ad the additional time is paid at two thirds of an employee's wage, wage rate up to $200 per day. Again, it has those huge exemptions. So it, um, employers with over 500 employees are exempt. Employers with fewer than 50 employees can seek exemption. And employers of healthcare providers and first responders can seek exemption from the DOL. And um, the reasons for leave here are if, if, if an employee is unable to work because their child's school or place of care is closed or ch their child care provider is unavailable because of COVID-19. So narrow reasons where you can use this. And both of these provisions, both of these paid, sick, paid leave provisions expire at the end of the year. 
And I guess I should just say as, as a background, um, you know, there is no other federal law providing paid leave to the workforce. There's about a dozen or so states that provide paid sick leave or paid family leave and, 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 and workers in those cases can accrue it, but they're all pretty modest programs. So this is the first really federal program, but again, it's, it's complete, it is, uh, it's specific to coronavirus and it will expire at the end of the year. Noah, can you talk a little bit about the logic of exempting employers with over 500 workers? Under 50, I understand yeah. financial hardship yeah. and straining of small businesses, but the logic of above 500? Other than that, these businesses have like enormous lobbying power. <laughs> I think the reason was their argument was that they, many of these larger employers already provide some paid leave. And I think perhaps it, the uh, Congress may have been thinking, we don't want to subsidize paid leave for larger employers. So again, all of these, both of these leave provisions um, are subsidized by the federal government, meaning that the federal government will give tax credits back to any employer who provides paid leave. So um, I think at the one hand, you know, it would have been uh, much more costly to provide tax credits to larger employers. And, and these employers also said, well, many of these employers at least said that they already provide some leave. I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, at NELP, we don't agree with that. You know, I think we, did, we were really against this exemption. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's really a shame. And it's, I, I think it's, I mean, I, I focus on temp workers and it's something like over 90% of temp workers who work for temp agency will not be able to access this benefit because most temp agencies are very large employers. And so you have a kind of a vulnerable workforce in that example, and the vast majority of the workers won't have this benefit. This is a, so it's a real shame. Um, and then I'll move on to the next one. So. I just talked about the paid leave provisions. There's another really big, um, a really, really big provision in both laws around unemployment insurance. So the first law, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, did a lot to bolster unemployment, the unemployment insurance program. So the states set their own unemployment insurance programs, but they're funded. The federal government provides funding, and oftentimes the federal government can, can uh, make funding contingent on states adopting certain practices. So in this first law, uh, uh, Congress allocated a billion dollars in funding for states to, to process their UI claims. And um, the funding is contingent on certain things being met. So the first installment, installment meaning the first 500 million, um, is uh, will goes to the states within 60 days, but it requires states to take certain measures to make it easier for workers to access UI, unemployment insurance. The first is employers have to provide notice to their workers of their, of the, uh, their eligibility for unemployment insurance. The second is they have to provide multiple claims States have to provide multiple claims filing methods, meaning they have to be able, they have to allow workers to apply online, by phone, in person, give them multiple ways to do that. And third, they have to show they've taken steps to improve the recipient's rate, which is the percentage of workers applying for unemployment insurance who actually get it. So if you have a very low recipiency rate, that means a lot of workers are applying and not getting it. And that's an indication that they're, the barriers to accessing UI are too high. The second installment of the funding occurs after a state's unemployment rate increases by 10%. And this requires, once a state's unemployment rate increases by 10%, they can access the, ex the second installment. But it also requires a second showing that they've taken additional steps to improve access to UI. And those, st those steps include one, waiving the, work, uh, waive the waiting week. A lot of states, for some reason, impose a week that um, uh, folks who are applying for UI, after they've been approved, they still have to wait a week without benefits before they can start getting paid their benefits. They'd have to waive the waiting week. The second one is waive work search requirements. Normally, if you are a UI recipient, you have to show that you're applying for jobs 
and that you are continually searching for jobs. Obviously, we that makes sense to waive that requirement in the middle of a pandemic when we don't want people out searching for jobs. The third one is it will non-charge employers for COVID-19 claims. So normally, um, employers' uh, tax rate for unemployment insurance is based in part on their experience rating. And the experience rating is based on how many of their workers have filed claims in the recent past. So what this would say is we're not going to, we're, we're not going to, for if if you have a former employee who seeks unemployment insurance because of a coronavirus related reason, that's not going to affect your experience rating and it won't make your unemployment insurance taxes go up. And so this kind of creates an incentive for employers not to kind of try to, to resist their or to contest their workers UI benefits. Um, and then there's a second, the second law that passed more recently, which is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act. And this one really expanded both the amount of benefits workers can get for unemployment insurance and the type of workers who are eligible for unemployment insurance. And it has a few different programs, uh, all of which are similarly named, so get confusing. The first is the Pandemic uh, Unemployment Compensation Program, or PUC. And what this program basically says is that if you are eligible for unemployment insurance, every claimant who's el who gets unemployment insurance will get additional $600 a week on top of what they're normally entitled to through July 31st. So if, for instance, you are an unemployed uh, worker, you file and you are normally entitled to $400 a week, just in an example, you will get $400 plus $600. So you'll get $1,000 a week through July 31st. And so this is an enormously great provision, particularly um, for low wage workers, they'll see full wage replacement even more than that. And so it is really a huge benefit for workers because there a lot of workers really are not gonna see any drop in income if they're unemployed. Um, the second is the pandemic employment unemployment, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation that basically just says, states have to add an additional 13 weeks of UI benefits, give, give uh, recipients an additional 13 weeks of UI benefits. Most states offer 26 weeks of UI benefits. So that means they would have to add 13 weeks to that and bring it to a total of 39 weeks. The last part of the bill is kind of um, the most, uh, is, is the part that really expands who's eligible for any type of unemployment assistance. And it's called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. And it pro provides unemployment assistance to workers who are normally excluded from UI or have exhausted their state UI benefits or who don't have enough work or, or who don't have enough work history to qualify for traditional UI. Uh, so these workers include independent contractors, freelancers, you know, and other workers who don't have a long enough work history to qualify for UI. So people who have kind of been left out of the UI system. And they have to certify that they're either partially or fully employed and unable to work for a COVID related reason. And they could be get up to 39 weeks of benefits. Um, and then there's a few other provisions in the CARES Act. Uh, there's a non-reduction rule, which means states can't decrease the maximum number of benefits. Uh, or the amount of weekly benefits available as of January 1st. And it's just ba basically telling states that if they want federal funding, they have to offer the full amount and for the full amount of weeks. Uh, and states that waive the waiting week will be reimbursed. And again, all three of the programs I talked about are fully federally funded. So the additional $600 per month, the uh, pandemic unemployment assistance for independent contractors and, and others, and all of those programs are federally funded. And the, the program for independent contractors, freelancers, and others who are not traditionally, uh, um, can't traditionally get UI, that program sunsets on December 31st. So again, it's, it's just a coronavirus related program. Uh, and so if, if we wanna kind of pursue something similar in the future, it would have to be new legislation.
And that is everything. Does anyone have any questions about that? So, so I have a question. So it seems from a comparative point of view, so some uh, countries focus their efforts to fight the economic repercussion of the COVID-19 through maintaining a certain level of employment. Right. And it seems that the US chose to follow a different path right. that focused on unemployment insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's it as far as the maintenance employment. Yeah. Can you can you say a little bit about what, what is the difference as far as workers? What What's the difference between maintaining your employment and simply getting the relief from you after you've been followed or terminated? Right, that's a great question. You know, I, I think there are real benefits to doing it the other way. Having, uh, you know, for instance, subsidizing employers so they maintain payroll. And um, the first bill also did that, but not very, not as much. And, you know, I think there's a few, a few downsides to the unemployment insurance system. One, it's not seamless, right? So especially now with millions of people applying, there's a backlog and it can take weeks for people to get benefits. And so that could just be economically, waiting weeks uh, can be economically devastating, right? Financially de devastating. Um, and then it also, you know, there's a psychic toll, right? These are people who are unemployed. Um, and then they have to kind of renew their job search uh, while we're in the middle of a recession potentially, right? So I do think that there is, there's real significant downsides to the way we do it here in the United States. And I think those are some of them. Um, I do think that it probably, you know, I think, I think it may, it may have made more sense to just kind of give uh, employers more of a subsidy to keep uh, their workers on a payroll on payroll. And honestly, I don't know why that wasn't adopted. And perhaps it's because, you know, we just don't know how long, this pandemic and the recession that follows will last. And I don't know, you know, perhaps, I, I just don't know if they, if, if maybe Congress thought, well, we can't, or we don't want to subsidize payroll for six months or something. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I don't know why, but I, I definitely see how other countries do it. And there's a lot of, that's appealing about that. Cool. So thank you, Larsa. Thank you so much. Uh, Rachel, floor is yours. Hi. Okay. I am, I'm not going to share slides. I'm just going to talk at you for a bit and then hope to sort of for a discussion. So I'm Rachel Lauder. I'm the executive director of Working Washington and the Fair Work Center. Thanks so much for having me. We're a Seattle-based multi-industry workers rights organization, fights for new rights for workers, makes those rights real through community-based enforcement. So think education and legal services, all while building a powerful grassroots movement to build political power for workers and change the conversation about income inequality and, and the dignity of work. Um, we've had a long history of making transformative demands um, and winning big for some of the hardest to reach workers, like domestic workers, fast food workers. We were the folks behind the first in the nation, $15 minimum wage. And we've been organizing uh, with gig workers through a, our Pay Up campaign, uh, which is a movement of over 10,000 grocery and food delivery app-based workers across apps and across the country. We believe it to be sort of the largest of its kind. Um, I'm going to focus mostly about the gig economy in this moment, um, but I do think it's important to just state up front how this pandemic has, ex has exposed across industries and across regions the precarity of low-wage work, um, that in America people are paid too little, don't have enough savings, are not provided sufficient protective gear um, or health and safety instructions in their jobs, uh, that tying health insurance to employment is misguided, um, I could go on and on, um, you know, we're continuing our organizing of folks in the food and restaurant industry or what's left of it um, in agricultural work and domestic work. And what we're going to do is just deep thinking about how we want to reimagine an economy that centers working people. Um, and our sort of theory of change here is that the only way to do that is if you organize and talk to working people. Um, which is you know, what our, our plan is for the next several months and obviously for the, the coming years. Uh, you know, I've been half joking that in this moment, we're all workers' rights advocates now uh, because it's been, you know, all these things have been exposed so clearly, um, but I really hope that that sticks sort of long-term as we think about how we imagine a recovery. Um, so I wanna pivot a little bit to the gig economy and talk sort of about it and its role in this moment uh, and what workers are facing. Um, 
And I think it's fair to say that the widely observed growth of the platform-based gig economy has undeniably expanded flexibility and opportunity for millions of workers and consumers across the country, right? We get goods and services in ways we've never been able to. Um, it's kickstarted the creation of new markets for labor and consumption, um, which had not previously been so easily accessible or so widely available. And it's also generated vast wealth, like billions of dollars are pouring into these platforms. Instacart, the grocery delivery app, its revenues grew like 75% last year. Um, it's valued over $7.6 billion. DoorDash is now valued at over $12 billion. But the folks who are actually doing the work on these platforms aren't sharing in the wealth. Um, I think that the explosion of the gig economy also reflects and exacerbates the decline of employment standards in traditional jobs, right? I mean, Laura knows this more than I do. Laura is more of an expert in it than I am. But, you know, something like almost 60 million people work in alternative arrangements, such as like gig and contract or temp work in America. And these folks have been found to be more financially unstable than the average American worker. So, you know, you hear these stats about how the average American worker doesn't have X amount of dollars um, for an unexpected emergency. You know, for folks who are in like uh, alternative arrangement work, it's like more than half don't have $400 um, in their bank account for an unexpected emergency. So what's happening is workers are supplementing insecure traditional jobs with insecure alternative work. Um, it's also just our general contention that the gig economy or the gig companies, the platforms aren't competing on the basis of technological innovation. They're really competing on a business model that's predicated on minimizing labor costs. Um, and so all the incentives are to pay people as little as possible. Um, so, you know, without, so with so much hand wringing about the gig economy, everyone's so excited about it. It's just, we've seen very little traction on policy solutions to improve job quality or stem the rapid growth of the sector. Um, so that's really what we've been working on, which is like, how do we organize and build power for these workers um, before this moment? And it's increasingly clear that we have to do it, um, it, you know, with even more vigor and with more like the smarter strategies in this moment. Um, because the food and delivery and grocery workers, um, you know, they are experiencing low wages. I'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, they've experienced tip theft, although we've mostly changed that pack practice now. Um, they experience complicated pay algorithms that change all the time, so they don't know what they're getting paid and why they're getting paid, and they lack access to a social safety net, like paid sick leave or any kinds of paid time off, which have emerged as really critical issues in this moment. Um, and then the other piece that's been so interesting is that during this global pandemic, um, these workers have now been deemed essential, right? They are sort of a critical part of our infrastructure to deliver food and goods to people who are social distancing. Um, but it, that sort of combination of being deemed essential and these being like very bad jobs is a very, is a big problem for us um, from a public health perspective, from an economic security perspective. Um, you know, before all of this, uh, before coronavirus happened, we, we've been organizing these gig workers for about a year and we've done a lot of different things um, from digital strikes to, you know, in-person you know, actions um, and a lot of what I would call narrative or air war work. Um, we've also collected a lot of data from workers directly because we're organizing directly with them. And you know, we found on Instacart, um, if you just accounted for some basic expenses, meaning like mileage and some payroll taxes that the worker would pay directly, Instacart workers are on average being paid $7.66 an hour. And DoorDash, um, our most recent study, pays even worse, which is sort of unbelievable. We have, our data showed that it was like less than $2 an hour that people were making if you backed out modest expenses. Um, and so, you know, the low wages that these workers face become all the more apparent and urgent during the, the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and the other piece that I mentioned before is that they don't have access to any um, paid sick days or paid leave. So if a gig worker isn't feeling well, is symptomatic, is concerned about their health, taking time off means that they're gonna pay, be paid nothing, um, which means that folks who may feel sick uh, might be delivering food and groceries to folks um, and serving as essentially vectors, right? So it's a real public health issue. Um, you know, our, 
we really feel like at the core of this is economic insecurity, right? So like the single most important thing that the gig economy platforms could do in this moment that would be good for public health is just to pay people more money. And I'll talk more in detail about what our sort of demands are and, and how we're doing it. Um, but, you know, I, we are talking to thousands of these workers and that's sort of the message that keeps on emerging, which is like, pay us more. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what we've done in, uh, in the context of coronavirus, and I'll talk a little bit about sort of what our future plans are in organizing. Um, Laura, do you mind if I ask the clarifying question before you jump into that? Oh, sure. Um, so we've talked about this a little bit in earlier sessions of our study group, but just for um, a refresher or for information for folks who might be new, can you talk a little bit more about how gig workers tend to be classified under federal employment law and how that affects um, their ability to get benefits like sick leave, um, as well as their ability to form unions. So, you know, what organizing looks like for this class of workers versus those who might be on formal payrolls. Sure, I, I mean, Laura, do you wanna talk about it too? Because I'm, I will, I will answer this question, but I also think that you probably have some good perspective on it. Um, so, you go first. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, you know, the main, you've probably heard of this concept called misclassification, right? So essentially what is happening is these workers are not, the platforms are, are considering these workers not as their employees, but rather as independent contractors. And essentially what that does is it allows them to not consider the, or apply the whole host of protections you get as an employee. And so the classification debate is really like, are these workers employees or independent contractors? Um, now, there are lots of, there's sort of court-made law and, legi and, and um, you know, legislation about tests that, you know, um, basically will help categorize who is an employee and who's not an employee. Um, and it's a, it's a very, very interesting debate. And we actually probably have some counterintuitive perspective on this a little bit. Um, which is that if you talk to a lot of these workers, the vast majority of them do not want to be considered employees of these companies. Even knowing the, vat, the universe of things they might be afforded um, because they value so deeply the flexibility of these jobs. Now, the flexibility has also been totally weaponized by these companies as a way to, like, they're not mutually exclusive, right? The idea of flexibility and having employment protections. Um, but it's, a, it's like extraordinarily complicated, particularly from the perspective of, of workers, which is like in their minds, this, this idea of having maximum flexibility to do their jobs is critical. And like my contention on this is that it's because traditional low wage work is so bad, mm -hmm. right? Because traditional low wage work, they're, they're comparing it to the, to you know, traditional retail or food service, fast food jobs. And what they know about that is they don't get paid anything, they have no flexibility in their schedules, they're fired at will. And the one thing, the one piece of dignity that the gig economy jobs bring to them is this idea that they can log on and off when they want, which isn't totally true either. Like, there's more complications than that. But it's, you know, this is sort of the, the heart of what's happened, like the heart of the conversation of the labor movement and what the strategy behind all of this is going to be in terms of how do we preserve the things we've won um, about employment law protections while also being really clear-eyed about where it's failed, right? And like how are we going to improve the things that already exist, right? And I think a good example of this, frankly, is paid sick days, paid sick days. So we have a paid sick days law in Seattle, which is hard fought and is you know something that people celebrate and uphold. But if you do your maximum accruals under the paid sick day law in Seattle, it's six days a year, right? Um, in this moment in time, when people are being told that they need to quarantine for 14 days, it becomes pretty clear that that's insufficient. Um, and so on the one hand, you're like, I wanna hold on and celebrate and uplift this paid sick day law uh, that we have in Seattle. And on the other hand, it's like, wait, we need more. Um, and so, you know, we work a lot with NELP in this, uh, on this issue because trying to figure out what's the right approach to, uh, the, to solving this particular problem is sort of at the heart of the struggle in the labor movement right now. Just a few additional thoughts on that. 
our we do a lot of we do a lot of organizing right we're not a we are you know sometimes we pretend to be a policy shop but we're really an organizing shop and um the one way to kill an organizing conversation with a frontline worker is to talk about misclassification right they do not care they're like just are you going to pay am i going to am i getting paid a fair wage or am i not getting paid a fair wage right so there's sort of an important framing of that the other thing that we're trying to what we are our sort of hypothesis here is if we can uh, fight for raising labor standards at the local level, which do not, localities do not have sort of jurisdiction over sort of misclassification determinations, if we can make it so that it is essentially more expensive for these platforms to classify their workers as independent contractors, then we're closing the loophole between independent contractors and employees. So this is like our hypothesis of a strategy um, for this. And like that's our long-term vision is similar to the fight for 15, where you went, where the campaign went sort of strategic jurisdiction by strategic ju jurisdiction to fight for raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And then now it's become a sort of a national demand. If you can do that in the gig economy and raise standards, you know, raise pay standards for uh, app-based, platform-based workers, then the classification debate could still happen, but we could be getting these folks paid better much quicker. Because the problem with the classification debate is that it's going to be litigated in the courts for years and years. All the while, these workers are still making $2 an hour. Um, so that was sort of a, a long one. Anyway, I don't know, Laura, if there's other things you want to say. super helpful. Laura, do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, Rachel, I mean, I think you you really kind of summed it up really well, particularly around the fact that like the independent contractor employee issue is one that, you know, a lot of workers want to be independent contractors. Well, actually, I mean, I think you could frame it as we found that if you ask gig workers, do you want to be in business for yourself or do you want to be an employee? They said you want to be in business for yourself. But if you tell them, you know, you ask them, do you want to be covered by minimum wage laws and discrimination, anti-discrimination laws, right? Or have the or have the ability to collectively bargain with other Uber drivers, for instance, you know, like they want those, oftentimes they want those individual protections that only apply if you're an employee, you know? And I think I'll just say like the whole independent contractor model was built on someone who is in business for themselves, right? Someone who is building a business, making investments in a business, uh, building a client base, determining what service they're, or good they're providing and at what, what price, right? Like that is like kind of the quintessential model, right? Like, and, and these most, most, I mean, most of these gig workers don't have any, can't do any of those things, right? <laughs> so they're not, and their work is completely dependent on this platform company for whom they work. And their only like control is their, you know, whatever, if they have flexibility over their hours to work, that, that's it. But as Rachel said, like that is, that flexibility is really important to a lot of workers, right? Particularly if you have another job already that has set hours, or you have childcare responsibilities, or anything else that, 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 you know, really makes it, really means you have to set your own hours. I mean, I think it's so true because so many people have really, uh, low, uh, have 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 financial insecurity and pressures from them at all from all aspects of their lives. Like the fact that they can set this this work schedule is really critical to them. So really, I do think it's true. The gig economy is kind of a symptom of larger issues in our society. You know. Yeah, one hundred percent agree. So I know I've probably taken up too much time. I will just talk briefly about what we're doing in this moment in terms of what our organizing has looked like and our advocacy. Um, and then happy to take any questions. So um, as Gali mentioned, we were one of the, we were the original American epicenter of the crisis. And actually the day that we went on sort of in our social distancing, um, when the governor went, went on the airways and said, no, you know, no more community events and people should start working from home, was actually the day that we launched our Seattle-based campaign to raise local labor standards. And we had this amazing event, uh, dozens of people, really worker-centered, um, 
And, but we talked a bit about coronavirus, and so we were able to very quickly get out some guidelines and recommendations to gig worker or to gig companies about what they should do to mitigate risk, including things like default no contact delivery, which have now been widely adopted. But you know, we were talking about that now five weeks ago. Um, we rolled out sort of our emergency demands around essential benefits for these workers, which include hazard pay, sick days, and safety supplies. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail about them. We are still doing our digital organizing. We held a national worker meeting yesterday and sort of shared similarly what Laura just shared with us about like what's available to them now in this moment because some of the federal laws are starting to shift. You know, it, it remains to be seen how well the states will be able to implement unemployment insurance for gig workers who previously had not been able to access this. So particularly in the Uber and Lyft context where that they are not working as much. Now, like Postmates and DoorDash folks are working more, but Uber and Lyft right now are super underemployed. So it's important, you know, this has been a really great federal response. Um, and we've dug into some of the app specific sick day policies, because you may have heard that you know, some of these platforms are starting to you know, roll out policies, but we, um, and I'll drop this actually in the chat. We've been sort of doing a, um, what I'd call like name and shame, um, just showing what people have said that they're going to, um, supply for folks, um, you know, what kinds of protections and are they really doing it? I think the main takeaway from this sort of to sum up the paid sick piece is that app companies, the platforms came out really early saying, oh, we're going to provide you with sick leave now. But it was like jumping, it's been jumping through hoops like crazy just to figure out how to get it. And so like it was a lot more about PR than actual substantive rights being uh, afforded to folks. Um, and then I think, you know, a big piece for us has been just making sure that worker voices are in this. So one of our food delivery um, worker leaders had an op-ed in the New York Times, um, which I can also try to find and send to, you, or you just Google, her name was Mariah Mitchell. You know, she's sort of sharing her story. Um, and we've just been making sure that workers are um, and their voices are being heard in this conversation about what protections they need. Um, in terms of the demands for what these app-based companies should provide to workers in this moment, you know, we're pretty bold. We're saying a minimum of 14 days of unrestricted immediate paid leave, um, plus additional access to leave, um, or access to additional leave if necessary, we're calling for hazard pay of $5 for each delivery, an additional $5 for a job that includes shopping. So to acknowledge the risk these workers are taking um, and extra time and attention the work now takes. Um, calling for protection and safety standards on the job, like gloves, hand sanitizer, disinfectant, and 100% contactless delivery to reduce exposure on the job. Um, and sort of just broadly this idea of compensation for lost income, like don't fight when workers are applying for unemployment benefits, commit to providing aid for workers who aren't eligible, if they're, you know, if that's a, you know, a particular circumstance, um, and just making sure that people are made whole in this moment. So those are the broad demands. I can also, I will find the link and send them to you so you can see um, our work. Um, but I, just to go back to my past point, which is, this really does feel like it's about economic security in this for this industry. And so, yes, these are specific sort of COVID-19 demands, but the idea of raising pay standards for the gig economy needs to be part of, needs to be on the table as part of the long-term solutions for this, because it's clear now that this, I mean, there's been lots of questions about whether or not this is an industry that will survive, right? You know. I think now in this moment, I mean, people are maybe rethinking that question because they're saying, well, if we have to, if we are going to experience these periods where we're doing lots of social distancing and we need a new infrastructure to deliver food and goods, for, you know, what is that going to look like? And so we're going to have to fix the problem that these are bad jobs in the long term. And so that means organizing with these workers to you know, change the narrative, build new structures of worker power, you know, um, Johnny, one of the things you mentioned was like, how does this relate to organizing? You know, not to go down way too much of a rabbit hole, but because these folks are not independent, because these folks are not considered employees, they're, as Laura mentioned, they're not covered by the National Labor Relations Board Act or National Relations NLRA, 
and protected under our organizing, which means that technically some of the organizing that we do um, might be in violation of, of uh, antitrust laws. And so it, that gets very, very complicated, but the point is the future of labor laws need to consider, and I know lots of great people like Sharon Block are thinking about this, which is like, how are we gonna build the structures that allow for these workers to organize effectively and sort of stand um, as unions and shift the balance of power um, going forward. So. Yeah. So, how oh, do wait, you go. How do you organize with the social distancing measures? How does it affect organizing, if, if, if any at all, because previously there were platform workers not socially you know, bonded together, but how does it affect? And one of your previous strategies in your former fight was to involve consumers mm -hmm. in your struggles, in your efforts to voice concerns. How do you kind of feel your way around consumers now? Are they more prone to align with workers because there's some safety and health issues? Or they're more aligned to keep a tight budget and worry that any benefit that they're working might get might come out of their pocket. So where, where, where things stand? Yeah. Um, so in terms of our organizing strategies, we had, like you alluded to, sort of already a deep understanding of digital organizing in this space. Right, and so we feel like, we feel very lucky and privileged that we had sort of like the head start on that. Um, it's different though with say restaurant workers um, or agricultural workers um, or domestic workers, but my organization has just invested a lot in digital organizing as a tool before um, COVID-19. So we have a running start. I think lots of folks in the movement are talking about like, how are we gonna get up to speed really quickly and be thought effective in this. I mean, and so a lot of what we do is, I mean, we've been holding Zoom meetings before holding Zoom meetings was like the norm, right? I mean, a year ago, we started having national Zoom organizing meetings with app-based workers where, you know, 800 people are showing up to them. Um, and so we, we, that's sort of built into our model because a lot of these workers have already been informally organizing in digital spaces like in Reddit and Facebook groups for years complaining about um, the conditions at work and we've been able to just amplify them. You know, we're, we're thinking through what our strategies are going to be in the context of work that was more offline um, than online, but it's the same stuff. Now everyone is at home. I mean, besides, I mean, and I don't want to discount the digital divide and access to computers, so it's really not going to reach everybody. Um, and I would just flag that unemployment insurance and not having access to a computer is going to be a major problem for folks because you can apply over the phone in some instances, but it's easier to apply um, in many states online and now the libraries are closed. Um, and so there's going to be some real access issues, but we're just going to do the best we can, which is pivot to making sure that all, you know, the digital organizing tools we developed in our app based work will apply to like our restaurant organizing, to our domestic worker organizing, and to our agricultural organizing. It's gonna be a lot more video work. And the consumer part, how do you estimate uh, their? I think that that remains to be seen. So I think right now we're seeing a certain amount of solidarity because everyone knows how, like, because this has impacted so many different kinds of workers and so deeply. Um, but I think that they're particularly in the grocery delivery space. Um, I think that you can see some rifts, uh, you know, developing here, which is this, this is how a lot of folks who are, you know, immunocompromised, the elderly, whoever who really cannot go grocery shopping are going to rely on their services. And so making sure that they don't become too expensive is going to be really key. I think it's been less of a, um, an issue in the food delivery space in part because the sort of prepared food delivery space because that's already something of a luxury market. Um, people are paying a pretty significant premium for already. But we'll see. Thank you so much. This was uh, fascinating. Johnny, do we have questions from the audience? Um, not yet, but I'd like to uh, invite folks to start adding questions um, into the chat. We can certainly um, field those to our uh, presenters, Rachel and Laura. Um, I mean, I'm happy to start us off. I sort of wrote down some questions while you both were talking. Um, you know, 
one thing I was thinking about is um, the impacts the large surges we're seeing in unemployment um, might have on demands and delivery of Medicaid uh, benefits. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've, I've heard a lot in the news and read a lot about, you know, direct payments that the federal government is making to American households and um, increases in unemployment um, benefits. But, you know, I'm curious, um, any work that you all might be doing around trying to make sure folks know what their, what options they have for medical care in this time of crisis when they're insurance might be disrupted because of unemployment. So, I mean, I'll sort of tell you what we're hearing. I mean, I think that that's, it's become one of the number one concerns for folks. I mean, a lot of the workers we work with already didn't really have great health insurance. So like there's sort of the baseline of just like an analysis, like it's all been, it's been broken for a long time. But I think a real big source of fear for folks is just the loss of healthcare. Um, and so we actually don't have, I mean, we don't have great answers for this in this moment. I think that state by state, like the exchanges are gonna figure out like ways to step it up. And like, there's been efforts to um, sort of even provide subsidies to employers to keep people on their employer provided health insurance. Um, and so, you know, we're sort of cobbling together the various pieces of guidance we can get to make sure that individuals are um, protected. But I think there's, this is sort of, it, I don't think it revives it because it was the conversation that was happening, which is like, why are we tying our healthcare to employment at all, right? And um, I think that it'll, you'll end up seeing a sort of reinvigorated movement towards you know, a new system of a social safety net that's not exclusively tied to employment because it's not just healthcare, right? I mean, it's like retirement benefits, other, you know, paid sick leave, paid sick days. You can imagine, I mean, I don't know if you guys have discussed this in previous contexts, but like portable benefits might be like a new, it, the conversation around portable benefits might get revived and invigorated because this pandemic has made it so clear that nothing is, it's not working what we're doing right now. Right, right. Laura, I saw you yeah. nodding your head. Do you want to add anything? Well, I mean, I think this is such a thorny issue. I, I mean, I'll say one thing that's, that I was just looking up. And um, so the unemployment insurance program that was just enacted, particularly the $600, it, it, including the additional $600 that folks get. Um, so if, you, if that puts you above the threshold for Medicaid, actually, so let me just say this. The unemployment insurance program that does just passed doesn't qualify as income for purposes of eligibility for Medicaid or CHIP. So what that basically means is people won't um, income out of Medicaid because they're getting unemployment insurance. Now that doesn't mean that doesn't apply to other programs, means tested programs, unfortunately. But I know Medicaid was one of them. But that's just a narrow question of like the folks who were previously on Medicaid will continue to qualify qualify for it, even if they're getting very generous unemployment compensation. But yeah, I mean, that does not resolve the larger question of the millions of people who are lo losing their employer-sponsored health insurance right now um, and in the middle of a pandemic, which is a massive problem. And, um, you know, honestly, I, I don't know what the answer of, to that is, other than we have to deal with the longer-term issue of not tying employment insurance to employment status, right? But that would probably, that is a much larger issue. Um, and, you know, I think this pandemic is just kind of exacerbating all of the existing inequalities, inequities in our, in, in, in our economic system that existed before. Now they're just, they're just a lot worse. Yeah. So talking about that, um, oh, we have a question, I think from, yeah, we have a question from a participant. Um, so we have a question from um, Eileen Bertolin. Um, she's a postdoctoral researcher. Um, let's see. Um, and she's studying in Paris. Um, and they're in, let's see. 
Her current research is on regulatory markets um, and migration. Um, so she'd be interested to hear a little bit of your thoughts on um, the labor force provided by migrants in this scenario um, and how would the new laws apply to them, if at all, or we need to think about other protections. Um, so, I, I guess it depends. For undocumented immigrants, um, they're not eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, so, this is a huge issue that we're just starting to think about uh, because there's so many benefits that undocumented people can't access. Um, and, you know, I think one thing, I mean, I think w one way to address this other than perhaps giving you know i think we need to do more cash benefits for parent for families to spend rent and utility payments to spend debt payments that might help for financial and security generally for family for Im for immigrant families um and then another possibility is just to if if people stay on, stay as employees and access paid leave, that might help. Um, in terms of migrants generally, um, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what else, um, what other provisions are, or what's being considered. It's just not my, it's not my background. So I just don't know. I mean, the, other, the only other thing I would add is I mean, we're definitely concerned about the lack of sort of income replacement policies for undocumented workers. Um, we're also, we're starting to talk to agricultural workers in Eastern Washington, sort of a base of ours, um, you know, who are right now working, right? I mean, they're sort of providing critical, um, they're, they're critical food supply for us. Um, but I think one of the big pieces for them is just health and safety protections. Um, so that's sort of our, our entry point into sort of migrant workers, yeah. you know, who do have work authorization, you know, a lot of them have work authorization, a lot of them don't, but some who do have work authorization, um, also just, you know, what is, what is the sort of universe of health and safety protections that we should be providing to folks um, in this moment, because they're really fearful about going to work right now. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Rachel, you know, I think one thing that was in the first bill but got I, uh, something, a proposal in the first law, but that, that didn't make it into the first law, but that was proposed was, would have required the Occupational Safety and Health Administration to issue a, an emergency health and safety standard for workers. Um, it would have required OSHA to issue a standard. OSHA really has like done nothing in this space. Um, and they really could require employers to take certain measures. I mean, there's some very common sense measures that employers should be required to take. You know, make sure hand sanitizer is accessible for every worker in the workplace. Give workers enough time to wash their hands with soap several times a day. Give everyone a mask. Uh, require everyone to stay six feet apart from each other. There's so many things that could be done uh, and really the federal agency that's responsible for kind of, in, you know, creating and implementing the standard has refused to do so. So, you know, what, what we're hoping is that states will step up in the absence and issue their own standards to protect workers. So, so I have a, I have oh, a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, Laura, if, if NELP would design the next stimulus bill, what would be the main components? Will we still see an emphasis on UI and sick leave? Would we see something else completely? What is your take? Oh man, <laughs> you know, I do, there was a proposal that just came out from House Democrats that would increase pay for emergency or for essential workers. So I think one thing we'd really love to see is an increase, a, a major increase in wages for workers who are deemed essential. So let's just raise the minimum wage now. So this is yeah. the hazard pay type of demand or is it something else? Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. So I, I wouldn't just do hazard pay because hazard pay is just a way for, to get to a way employers can avoid implementing health and safety standards. I think there should be an increase in pay. I don't even like to call it hazard pay because like, I still think you need to have safety measures in the workplace, but for workers deemed essential and particularly, we need to really substantially increase their, their wages. I think 
implement, we need, also need to implement a health and safety standard like the one I just talked about. Um, you know, I, I do think there has to, we have to do a lot more uh, for, for families generally, you know, unrelated, not, not necessarily tied to work, right? But, but like, it's like um, more cash benefits for, for families and really uh, suspending uh, rent and utility payments uh, for, for people who are in financial distress, things like that would be really, really important. Um, whew, what else are we thinking of it now? Let me, let me think about it and I'll, I'll get back. Let me, let me look at what we're, what we're thinking about for the next bill. I don't know. Laura, while you're thinking about that, um, I have a good question that, that might be, um, best or well fielded to Rachel as well. So, um, Daniel Porfido wrote in our chat and asked, um, where are advocacy and organizing efforts best directed? It seems like we need a massive coordinated national effort, but the federal government and the administration seem woefully um, ill-equipped to do this. So what else can we do at the state level um, that could potentially be enough? Uh, what needs to happen at the federal level and what can be done um, to better or more quickly uh, resolve these ongoing issues uh, at the state level? No, it's a, I mean, it's a really excellent question. I think one of the things that this has exposed is sort of gaps in the infrastructure in, in the movement um, around advocacy for working people. So, you know, the labor movement has taken a real big hit in the last several decades in America. Um, and it's still, you know, we still stand shoulder to shoulder with traditional labor in all sorts of ways. And there's still, you know, they have a lot of electoral strength and there's lots of, you know, they, they need to be a part of the solution. And then there's great national policy organizations and advocacy organizations like NELP and, you know, the Economic Opportunity Institute and the EARN Network. I mean, there's lots of um, sort of good national coalition policy and advocacy orgs. Then there's like the worker centers and worker advocacy orgs like mine that are in uh, cities and in states. Um, but in terms of what, like sort of a national organization for working people, it doesn't exist right now, right? That I will tell you that there are people who are working on it, um, you know, but in this moment right now, it's like, oh man, I wish we had it, right? Because what, to me, one of the big issues that we need to figure out is how we translate um, sort of the, you know, the hypothetical NELP wish list of things that should be in the federal stimulus into real political power for people. And what I mean by that is, to, you know, demanding it of our decision makers both at the state and federal level and then holding them accountable or when they don't actually make the decisions that align with what people need. Um, so, you know, we're going to, we are planning for that. You know, I'm sort of writing up all these proposals now about how we're going to rethink our Washington state political strategy so that we can build what I'm calling like, um, you know, a multi-industry, multi-racial coalition of working people who will have independent political power in Olympia to, to drive our recovery efforts. Um, and so there's certainly efforts happening state by state and city by city, and you can plug into national conversations, you know, through NELP, um, we're an affiliate of something called the Center for Popular Democracy, which is a national progressive organization that does a lot of work with NELP also. And they're thinking about, for example, what would a, what would a national effort around unemployment insurance look like? Um, you know, so there's lots of conversations happening around the country right now. Um, but it is a little bit of like, oh, we now need to catch up because of how exposed the need was. But there are still good advocacy orgs and good sort of grassroots on the ground orgs doing the work, um, depending on where you are and sort of what you're interested in. Because you can also, you can enter it through different industries. You can enter it into from a conversation around revenue. You could enter into it from a conversation around paid leave, right? There's so many ways to direct the organizing and advocacy. I'll just ask the mirror image question of this question. What happens to business coalitions in this time? Yeah. Do you think that we'll find more unity, more fissures? Johnny, you can jump in if you'd like. Um, but how does it look from your point of view? Because obviously the, the other side always looks more united than your side. I think that's like a tenant. But is it, is it really the case or can we find those splinters along the way? 
question, question. They do, yeah. they do often seem much more united, but that's yeah. also because they have a lot more resources. Resources, so. yeah. So, I mean, one just anecdotal thing that I've, I've seen that's very interesting in Seattle is sort of a new, uh, the emergence of a new coalition of independent restaurants mm. um, and small restaurants that, you know, we have a restaurant association here that's very powerful and has been sort of our like sworn enemy for years and fighting, you know, against labor standards. Um, but sort of a new coalition of independent restaurants as smaller restaurants that seem to have actually more of our interests aligned. Um, and we're actually going to reach out to them. Um, we actually, we, we, we have reached out to them because we want to start talking about, you know, where is there overlap in our interests in terms of the recovery effort? So you might see a little bit more of like the small businesses coming together in an interesting way, which I think would be a really beneficial thing for our economy. So I'm sorry, I, I need to go in, in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to add one more thing in response to your question about, you know, what we'd want to see in a in the next package. And I think this is something we wanted to see in the first package. So I don't know if the ship has sailed, but you know, one thing that we always push for is that when the federal government is giving funds to companies, that it's tied, that there's that there's conditions attached, right? So you know, any additional bailout, bailout funds, we're always looking for conditions like an increase in wages, you know, allowing workers to unionize without, without pressure, neutrality campaigns, um, workers on corporate boards, right? There should be representation by your workforce on your, on your board of directors and a limit on, on, on and stock buybacks that allow companies to artificially inflate uh, the the worth of their of their um, stock price things like that so we really always if if there's an opportunity to do that in the future we will definitely be pushing for that cool thank you so much Donna, for joining us thank you so much for having me talk to you soon um so you know similarly so Laura was was talking about um, what some of her organization's longer term um, goals might be or what they'd like to see in a version two um, of a stimulus package and we have a participant who just raised a question in the chat um, that brings up the issue not just of um, economic relief, but how we can potentially resolve the negative impacts of the pandemic on our democracy. Um, so this person is asking about, are there any permanent or long-term changes uh, that we can promote among, amid this crisis um, for long-lasting impact um, in terms of accessibility to uh, the polls? Um, and in terms of, of sort of building grassroots political power. Yeah, well, so it's funny. I mean, we have vote by mail in Washington and we feel very lucky that we have it. And so, um, and it's very easy to administer. So certainly I think every, I guess the thing, the thing I will say in response to this is that like everything about the recovery should be up for discussion. And what I mean by that is like, our democratic institutions, how we build power for working people, how we think about healthcare, how we think about you know, our budgets. You know, I'm really worried about austerity budgeting in state capitals in the next several years where like, you know, they're gonna just slash budgets because revenues are, are down. Um, and what that's gonna mean for all sorts of services for folks. So, you know, I guess my, the thing I would just encourage folks to think is like, we should be thinking in very bold transformative ways about what a recovery looks like. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, quote Winston Churchill, but I'm pretty sure he was the one who said, like, never waste a crisis, right? Like, and so if you're thinking about what social, like, social movements look like in this moment, we have to figure out, you know, at all levels from, you know, rules of the game, rules of engagement and democracy down to, like, you know, local labor standards, um, what we can ask for and, and demand of people. But you're totally right that if we don't, figure out how to do vote by mail, we're going to have a hard time having a legitimate election likely um, in the fall. And that's going to open up a whole new, you know, a whole other set of questions about, um, you know, democracy and, and how we make decisions. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of conversations happening uh, on that side of the, you know, in the world and then on the worker focus side of the world and just, you know, in the economic security side of the world. 
Yeah, and I mean, to Gali's question, um, you know, I am hopeful that this crisis might encourage some, um, some organizing on the part of business in terms of, you know, requesting more support for the federal government, for small business and for workers, because, um, you know, businesses are, are suffering now too. And of course it's not in the same individualized ways as workers experience. Um, but, you know, I'm hoping that this, this uh, crisis might make, you know, everyone on both sides of the employment um, relationship realize the um, insecurities in our current system and think about ways that we can make it more, more durable um, and more beneficial in, you know, in all respects. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you know, it's not um, readily obvious to me, for example, why employers, um, you know, wouldn't want to advocate for um, federally mandated and federally funded sick leave or maternity leave for that matter. Oh. Um, and, you know, I'm curious to see how this particular crisis, you know, shapes business thinking on that because, you know, they are vulnerable to losing workers. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that, you know, you're going to see, I think, unique moments of solidarity between working people and some of the small businesses, right, that um, could potentially, if, if done well and thoughtfully, could lead to some interesting like advocacy opportunities. Because, you know, the folks who worked at all of these bars and restaurants that were sort of a central part of Seattle's economy, you know, the, they feel like, they feel solidarity with their employer here, right? Which is their employers were for, forced to shut down. And through, because of a, you know, totally unexpected, well, not totally, but like a global pandemic. And um, that's, how workers channel their frustrations and sort of how they're agitated may not be directed at their small employer, but certainly could be directed at why isn't the government providing some basic, you know, you know, a set of basic safety and social protections for us that would help both sides of the equation. So I think you're totally right. I think it'll be really interesting to see. I have uh, one last question on my end. Yeah. So there's a theory, and I want your take on that, that part of the rise of the gig economy, the platform economy, was as a kind of repercussion of the 2008 crisis, where people lost their jobs, and then they found those new kind of alternative ways of um, getting work, getting money, and that kind of facilitated the rise of Uber, Instacart, all of yeah. those models. So, do you think that from the stories that you read, is this story true? And if it is true, can we expect the same kind of mechanism to happen two months from now, three months from six months from now, as this army of the unemployed would find this kind of alternative um, arrangements or, or, or should we expect something else? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a really interesting theory. It, it definitely, it dovetails with my theory around just like the gig economy being a symptom of precarious traditional low-wage employment right like you're what we see are workers who sort of have the following thing situation they work 20 hour 20 to 25 hours at, in retail or in fast food um you know and they're always they can they can never get enough hours and their employers are always scheduling them under the threshold that would trigger provision of benefits right so they're always looking for hours and they can't get them then on top of that they're working you know 10 to 15 hours on one of these platforms in it for a gig company. And then they have 10 hours of caregiving responsibility, right? So folks are cobbling together a bunch of precarious work um, and, you know, and are, are still feeling underemployed and don't have enough money. So that coming out of a two, the 2008 crash feels very plausible to me, right? That like you could, and you know, with the rise of just the, the tech innovation was like very easy to set up these platforms and then you know, create the market. Um, I can't even get into a headspace right now where I'm thinking about what the next version of that looks like. Um, you know, to me, it just looks like more of it because as you can see an Instacart, Instacart just announced that they were going to try to hire 300,000 new people to deliver groceries. I mean, 
hundreds of thousands of more people are going to go into this market. So when everyone was saying like, oh, the gig economy is dying, like it's actually pretty small, like it's not going to work. I mean, and you know, maybe I'll be proved wrong, but like my assumption is that this, this is just going to grow even more, which is, you know, all the more reason to figure out what the, what are the governing rules of the economy. Yeah. Cool. So thank you so much, Johnny. Any more questions? Um, well, I think we don't have any more in the chat. So um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll loft up one more um, question for Rachel because I, I like playing with this thought experiment. Um, so, you know, I'm curious to hear, Rachel and, and Golly, um, what the stimulus packages that have passed suggest to you about opportunities for future reform. And I guess what I mean by that is we heard so much during the Democratic primary debates and have heard um, in American political discourse generally, um, this narrative that doing things like increase, so, uh, increases to the social safety net, universal um, health care, increasing the minimum wage would just be too costly. There's no way we can do it. I know. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And so I guess I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what the present moment, you know, tells us about that narrative um, and, and the possibilities for longer term change. Yeah, I mean, I think you sort of alluded to it, which is that I think it just opens the door for bigger demands and sort of a calling out of this, right? Which is that if you can inject $2 trillion into the economy through stimulus, um, like this with like, you know, no public debate, then, you know, all of the excuses that we've heard about, you know, why we can't, can or can't do something feel like, we can, you know, we can bat down those arguments. Um, and, but that, but I do think what it allows us to do is just go through this thought experiment about what do we want the economy to look like, right? And like, how are we going to support working people so that um, they're sort of centered, like, I mean, our contention is that working people are the, are the economy, that the stock market isn't the economy, right? So that supporting working people so that they have what they need to live and thrive in their communities, sort of that, you know, middle out moment feels like we have to ask for that. And I think that similarly, that's what encourages entrepreneurship, right? Like if you have the security to know that you're going to have healthcare, like why wouldn't you start your business? Um, so I just think what it forces us to do is just ask, the bigger questions. I think that the challenge becomes like, how do you translate the big ideas and, the, and sort of the bold vision into real policy change, into real political action? Um, which is why some of those questions about like, you know, democracy and how, you know, the rules of the game really do come into play so much because um, that becomes really hard, right? We, we have a um, democratically, um, we have a democratic majority in all the branches of government in Washington state, but we still have to fight all the time on labor standards, right? Um, sort of what we consider to be the most basic of protections for folks. Like, how do we translate this moment where we're gonna ask the big questions into like actual change at the state house is gonna be like the real challenge. That's really interesting, yeah. So well, thank you so much, right? Yeah, I think we're just at about- amazing. Well, thank you so much for including me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much, Rachel. And thank you, everybody, for listening in. We appreciate it. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing everybody again. The 15th is our next session, right, Golly? Next week, yeah. Yeah, next week at uh, 12, I think. Okay, great. All right. Well, we will uh, talk to everybody soon. Thank you again, Bye. Rachel. Bye. Thank you.